Um, we're trying a different streaming format this morning, so I hope this works for you. I don't have a camera to show you everyone else here, but we do have seven of us, seven of us together this morning live. And if you're joining us, oops, yeah, if you're joining us live, uh, welcome. I hope this works. This is the first time using this streaming format, so you have to let me know if it works or not. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, welcome everyone. We're finishing up Hezekiah today. Essentially, we'll be looking at um, Manasseh, but we got one more study left on Hezekiah to look at. And one of the reasons that I switched the, the screen to the laptop format, that is I'm trying to show them the, the study notes so they can follow along with that, instead of having to stare at me the whole time. As fun as that might be. So you got a, a new study guide booklet on your table. Go ahead and help yourself to a copy if you want one. <clears throat> this study should take us to the rest of the kings of Israel and Judah. This will close off our study. And where we're picking up in this booklet is page 16 is what you have to turn to. Like I said, we're going to finish off Hezekiah today. There's also timelines on your table. If you're looking at our website, you'll see a, the chart. You can download the timeline. Problem with this format is I can't tell if anybody else has joined us online or not. So I just have to guess, I guess, if someone's watching us. Yeah. And you can't wave hello to them this time, but. Okay, oh, no, someone's joined us. It does, it does indicate. Thanks for joining. I don't know who it is, but someone's here. So we have at least one more person joining our group. Welcome to our group. Uh, there's seven of us here in person and we're glad you're joining us online. All right, so page 16 in the handout. I'm gonna actually switch and that's why I have this format is, well, look at that, it won't even let me. The only reason I did this is so I could switch to the screen, but it doesn't let you do that live. Yeah. Okay. Well, next time maybe I'll have to start with that. Okay. So the screen switch does not work right here. I thought it might. Okay. Well, I guess you'll get to stare at me the whole time again. Page 16 in the study guide, otherwise you can go to our website, rockofages-dason.com, and there you'll find the handout, you'll find all the other handouts, and the other videos for the other studies. Why don't we start with the prayer as we start our time together. Lord, we thank you for another day of your grace and another opportunity to grow together as we look to the lessons we have from the final kings of Judah. Uh, this morning we ask that you be with Joan as she can't be with us, as she's recovering after her trip to the hospital yesterday uh, down in the valley, and she discovered a, a mass on her kidney. Uh, we ask that you give her comfort and peace and guide the doctors uh, that they can uh, apply the correct treatment. Uh, we ask that you also be with Irma as she's facing back pain and difficulty with that, as well as be with uh, Barbara Miller and the Dows as they're recovering from COVID. Lord, bless us as we turn to your word. Amen. Okay, so let's see if I can switch this. All right, I'm going to read the top there of page 16 for you, just to start us off. When God healed Hezekiah, he'd given a sign uh, which he would live and involved the shadow of the sun going backwards 10 steps on his stairway. A pretty significant sign, I'd say. A word of his healing, the miraculous sign, no doubt, uh, the defeat of Sennacherib's army reached the Babylonians. Uh, so now we're on Isaiah 39. Uh, actually, did we do that one on his miraculous healing and the steps come backwards? Actually, we're on page 15, aren't we? If I'm not mistaken. We did 15? Oh, yeah, that's right, because we looked at Isaiah 38. Okay, so now we're in the destructive power of pride. 
So word of his healing, that's what we looked at last time. Um, and the miraculous sign also reached Snackerb's army as uh, they realized what had happened. So now we got to turn to Isaiah 39. We see in 2 Chronicles 32, 31, the Babylonians came. And they were kind of curious about this sign that they heard. And also, did a, no doubt, how did you defeat Snackerb's army? So the Babylonians are investigating Isaiah chapter 39. At this point, you got to remember, Babylon came on the scene pretty quick as an influence in the area. Uh, they were not a threat to Israel, or at least Israel wouldn't have perceived them as any, any sort of a threat, unless they were listening to the prophets who warned them that God was going to send them. So Isaiah 39. At that time, Merodach, Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a gift to Hezekiah because he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick and had recovered. And no doubt he also heard about the military victory. Um, this guy is sending a gift, and that was typical if you want to show a sign of peace or establish some sort of a treaty with them. Now, if you heard that there was an army that defeated the Assyrians, you'd probably want to make a treaty with them, right? So it kind of makes sense. Hezekiah was happy to receive the envoys, and he showed them the palace and his treasury, the silver and the gold, the spices and the precious oil. So his whole armory and everything that was found in his treasuries, there was nothing in his palace or all his domain that Hezekiah did not show them. And it sounds like he's being pretty thorough, doesn't it? <laughs> Showing off. Then Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah and asked him, What did those men say, and where did they come from? Hezekiah replied, They have come from a faraway country, from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? Hezekiah said, They have seen everything in my palace. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Now maybe he's thinking he's like Solomon showing the queen of Sheba his great wealth so that they might be impressed. Uh, but he's more of a cornered animal that's really saying, look what I got that you can take from me. Uh, you're more powerful than me, and you could probably take this. The prophet uh, Hezekiah said, they'd seen everything. There's nothing in my treasures that did not show them. Verse 5, then he Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to the word of the Lord of armies. Listen carefully. The days are coming when whatever is in your house, everything that your fathers have stored up until today, will be carried away to Babylon. Not a thing will be left, says the Lord. They will take away some of the sons who were born to you, your own children, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Actually, if you look at the timeline, it'd be uh, his <clears throat> grandchildren would die, his great-grandchildren would be carried off. Um, then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which is spoken is good, Hezekiah said, for there will be peace and stability during my days. So what was his interest? He was all concerned about his time, his lifetime. Forget about what's going to happen to the next generation. Okay. So what should have been the first thing, or what should have been the first thing Hezekiah shared with the envoy from Babylon? You know what the first thing was? It was all his treasures and his wealth. What should have been the first thing, though? Yeah. We have a, a mm. Lord God who's done these wonderful things. Oh, by the way, he, he's the one that defeated the army of the Assyrians, and he's the one that we worship, and this is his temple, and he's a glorious God. Why do you suppose he wanted to show off his great wealth? Sure. Yeah, we, we see how Hezekiah was a, a godly king, right, with his reforms and serving the Lord. And yet when wonderful things happened, you know, being healed, having that great sign with the sun going backwards, having the army of the Assyrians destroyed, it starts to go to your head when, when God serves you, in a sense, because he stoops down in grace to that level to serve you and answer your prayers starts to go to your head, doesn't it? You lose sight of it all being that he's the one to glorify. He's done this all in grace. What is the first thing that you like to show people when they come to your house? 
Your wood shop? Sure. Come see what I built. Anything else anyone can share? Sure. Just the way that your house is decorated can send a message, yeah. Someone comes to your house, first thing they, they might notice is, okay, either it's a poor setting or it's a rich setting. It doesn't matter if the, the Lord is what makes it rich, right? First thing I show them is the, the Murphy bed that I made in Bill's wood shop. Just a neat feature. But they'll notice, too, in our house uh, that what is important is focused on the word. What are some ways you can reflect thanks to God when people are interested in learning more? How can you glorify and give thanks to God when someone wants to learn more? Visitors come to your home or you have company over and you're having conversation with them. How can you direct that to God's glory? Yeah, it's not too hard to do. This acknowledgement is one thing. Someone says, oh, hey, I really like your deck. Thanks. We are blessed by God. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that leaves a testimony when you sell the house, right? You got it part of your architecture in your home. Okay. Yeah, even if the company might not agree with you on spiritual matters, you could at least say, it's our custom in our house to say a prayer. Hope you don't mind, and you can listen along. Or if they're a Christian who might want to pray with you, say, I'm going to say a prayer, uh, giving thanks to God for our food, as we, as we like to do here. So just small things, right? doesn't seem like Hezekiah even focused even the bit on that. He was all focused on the wealth. If you look at that, that list, it's almost a categorical list of all the wealth that he showed him. Uh, even the best of kings of Jerusalem had faults that are recorded for us. Hezekiah is nearly one of the best. The fact that he instituted reforms, faithfully serving the Lord, um, trusting in him in great trial and adversity. But still, here's his fault, right? It's not like you see, oh, there's a king, and he is obviously perfect in every way. It intentionally lists for us that each of these kings has their fault. Almost like the, it's trying to help us to see these are fallen men uh, that lead God's people. They're, they're not perfect. It's kind of started off that way, right? Uh, Saul, at first good, but then had his faults, great faults, and fell away. David. Man after the Lord's heart, but had his faults, great faults. Solomon, the Lord asked, you know, asked for wisdom, and he got wisdom. He was great. He was prosperous. And then he had great faults as he built idols and absorbed the idols of his multiple wives that he took in ungodly relationships. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, as we're... Con as we're concluding this study in the kings, I want you to see that. You know, that all these kings, why is this recorded for us? It, it leads us yearning for someone more than an earthly ruler and leader, someone that's greater than the greatest of kings. We've, we've had our disappointments in leaders, even in spiritual leaders, right? And we find it's all directing us to the, the good shepherd, the king. So... Yeah, what does that impress on us? One, that we need a king and that we should yearn for that, that king. Yeah, look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these faults aren't listed in order to you know, list these people as those that are condemned. They're listed to show us that they, they needed grace just as we need grace. God, God's mercy and his undeserved love for the sinner. 
And it should also impress on us not to be, I think you're getting at that too, right? Not to be hypercritical, right? So if someone does have a fault, yes, you'll hold them accountable, but not, oh, you made a mistake. They're no longer any good. Get rid of them. <laughs> Happens every day, right? But still, grace keeps holding on to you, right? You know what? Yeah. No other king has recorded, has more recorded on their life in scripture than Jesus. So you look at all these kings. Uh, there's some couple chapters on here and there, but Jesus has a lot more recorded. Why is it so important that scripture emphasizes his faultless character for us? Why do we need to see Jesus's perfection? Sure. Uh, he definitely is the only one that we could say, Here, here's a king worth following. Here's a trustworthy king, a faithful king, one who will not fail us. Also, he's not just our king. He's the one who stepped in our place, right? So he is the, the perfect one that did what all these kings couldn't do. He's the son of David who lived in David's place, lived in our place. He is our righteousness. So that, that gives us comfort that he is our source of holiness as he credits that to our account. All right, any other thoughts on Hezekiah before we jump to our, our main man for today, Manasseh? All right, we're going to go to what is described as the worst of all the kings. And oddly enough, he's, he's actually preceded and succeeded by what are some of the best of the kings. But he is he's the worst. And I'm not just saying that like, oh, he's just terrible. The scriptures describe him as such. It says no other king did more evil. He adds to the evil of the other kings. He gets worse than the, the people that lived in Canaan before him. He leads the people astray. And it's so bad that Manasseh gets blamed for the reason, he is the reason why God ultimately has to say, I'm going to do away. I'm going to wipe away the line and decimate the people of Judah. So I'm going to read the introduction from Manasseh here. <clears throat> Manasseh's reign was marked with relentless wickedness. He worked hard to undo all the reforms of his father, Hezekiah. So that right there kind of adds to the evil, right? The fact that he had a good father, but he's working to undo those reforms. He traveled throughout the land to firmly establish idol worship. He was ruthless <clears throat> and murdered countless innocent lives so that, this is from 2 Kings 21, he shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. He sacrificed his children in the fire to the god Molech. And the translations sometimes will read the more literal, made his children pass through the fire, but that, that really seems to be indicating of uh, they were actually sacrificed. He built altars for false gods in the temple of the Lord. So he takes the temple, doesn't close it like we saw before. Now he's actually opening it up for false worship use. In addition to pagan worship with Baal and Ashtra, he instituted worship of the stars and planets. So uh, we would call that superstition today. You'll see people trying to ally gems and stones and you know, looking to the stars for truth and trying to foresee information in the future. Well, that, that's what Manasseh was doing too. Uh, working with what would be similar to a, astrology. Not astronomy, but astrology. The Lord was patient with such great sin, but the king and the people were obstinate. So he ruled for 55 years. He had a long time. It says, in 2 Chronicles 33, Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the people of Israel. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So just multiplying sin upon sin, not only in the temple, increasing false idolatry, adding to those sins, he also 
decides, you know what, I'm going to do worse than the people that God drove out before us. And if that's not enough, God's speaking to him during that whole time. You know, the, the, the Canaanites that were driven out of the land didn't have, as far as we know, didn't have prophets besides the witness of Abraham hundreds of years before. Uh, but these people, Manasseh and his people, they're obstinate against the word of the Lord that's revealed to them. And this I find kind of interesting. Look at that chart. You got the handout chart? Examine that chart. How many prophets do you see listed under Manasseh? There's a little bit of Isaiah overlap I indicated. I think he could have been alive at that point and something of an influence. But how many do you see? None. Yeah. Even though it says in Scripture God sent his prophets, apparently none of them were able to reach a level of prominence. As Manasseh's, maybe they were sacrificed. They were, they were shut out. They were silenced. He did not give them a hearing. So their messages were either destroyed or they were destroyed before it could make any impact. And, and who knows, maybe there was a prophet whose readings and things were available during the life of Manasseh, but they didn't survive his reign. In fact, we're going to see the king after Manasseh, Josiah, even has to discover the, the Bible that was lost during his time. So the, during his 55-year reign, he silenced the prophets. He silenced the reading of the word of God and the teaching of the word of God. And it was just a horrible, horrible time. All right. Uh, Finishing up the description of Manasseh here. When the Lord humbled Manasseh and made him a prisoner of the king of Assyria, he repented. He was returned to the throne. And this wasn't just some false repentance like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't hurt me. It was genuine. He enacted sweeping reforms with earnest faith. His own soul was saved, but his reforms came too late to undo the damage already done to his kingdom. Despite his miraculous conversion and repentance, Manasseh is labeled the evilest of all kings and is credited with the cause for Judah's downfall. You see that listed there in 2 Kings in two places and also Jeremiah 15. So you can read about Manasseh in 2 Kings 21 and 2 Chronicles 33 and following. He, after he repented, he was restored to his, his throne. So kind of a Amazing, miraculous, both restoration of him being allowed to return to his land, but also even more miraculous, the fact that he repented with, and was converted and came to worship the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as an individual, yeah. Right. Well, God held God held the whole nation accountable. But he was the, I guess you'd say, the instigator. And, yeah. Sure. Right. Um, this violence against the, you mentioned in one case example, the unborn children in our nation is, how is that any different from the violence that was taking place with Manasseh shedding innocent blood? And the people in the time were complacent and allowed it. And to what extent do we remain silent and not become a voice to speak up against the evil? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it, it really stems back to before that time, even just the disintegration and dishonoring of marriage uh, that, that God gives that God gives this blessing of husband and wife to remain faithful and to model Christ in the church. Uh, that, you know, not just by divorce, but by other things, slowly eroded. Uh, the honoring of God's gift of sexuality slowly eroded and the understanding of God's gift of sexuality slowly eroded and was lost. And now it's dishonored on, on every front uh, by, by all spectrums of society. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to have an opportunity to discuss some of this here. Let's go to page 18 in the, the first study on Manasseh. Okay, page 18 there. How great is God's patience? Discuss what is often considered and implemented as the best strategy for doing mission work. So say a church body or a congregation decides we're going to carry out a mission. What's often used as the best strategy? Who are you going to send missionaries to? The unchurched, sure. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. So you look, you look for an area where there's not too many people that have the Christian faith shared with them, and you say, those are people that need the gospel, right? Uh, often mission work will be done then if they do that, and then, oh, a lot of people actually do want the gospel there. Let's, let's send missionaries because they want the gospel there. Should we send missionaries only to places which are receptive to the gospel? Or should we target places where there's great rejection and they don't want the gospel? Yeah, and that's not the easiest place. And quite often mission work will target the place where, oh, look, there's people there that want the gospel. Let's go there first. But imagine targeting places where they clearly oppose and reject the gospel. Just saw a post this morning on some of the mission field areas, which, which we have mission work involved in, where there's persecution happening. Uh, people are being arrested and thrown in prison or driven out of their homes because they share the gospel. Uh, that's not the place where a lot of church bodies will say, there's where we must send missionaries. I think about God and Manasseh and sending his prophets to a place where there's not just a need for it, there's a rejection of it. So think about which one's easier. Obviously, it's much easier to say, let's send missionaries there where they're, they're, they need us and they want us. Which one does you think God wills that we work more towards? or at least that we make our end goal to work towards. Certainly all. He, he wants those who are eager. He wants all nations. Um, let's read Second Chronicles 33. Got to open up to Second Chronicles chapter 33. Starting at the first verse there. Yeah, he was rather young. So you think about Hezekiah, you know, only had up until he was 12, but that's still quite a significant part of his life to influence him. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he ruled as king in Jerusalem for 55 years. And actually, I think if you look at the timeline, there there was probably something of a co-regency overlap there. Accommodate for him having such a time. Verse 2 of in Second Chronicles 33 now. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the disgusting practices of the nations which the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which his father Hezekiah had torn down. He erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He worshiped the whole army of the heavens and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, about which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem, my name will be forever. He built altars for the whole army of the heavens in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced fortune telling and sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He greatly increased the evil deeds he did in the eyes of the Lord and provoked him to anger. 
he placed the image of the carved idol that he had made in the house of the house of God, about which God had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not make the feet of Israel wander again from the land which I assigned to their fathers, but only if they are conscientious to carry out everything I have commanded them, all of the law, the statutes, and the ordinances given through Moses. Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had driven the Lord had destroyed before the people of Israel. So I'm going to talk about him being credited. He's described here, he seduced them to do evil. So he's like an agent of evil here. Finally, verse 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. That would have been speaking to him through the prophets. So we're going to talk today about how great God's patience is. Uh, Manasseh had a godly father, had many prophets sent to him, and had a long reign of 55 years. Despite all this, he, his wickedness even exceeded that of the godless nations that came before Israel. What does that fact impress on us? Yeah, the, the human heart is capable of turning aside from the Lord no matter what their circumstances and, and turning to the furthest depths of evil. You, you would think with a godly father and a godly prophets around him and all this time to consider this that he would have at least been somewhat not evil, but he just goes head first into evil. That, that can happen. And I'm sure some of us have witnessed that, uh, that you would never expect someone that you know to turn to godlessness and wickedness they turn in the worst way despite having spiritual support and connections and family. Sure. Yeah, it says he was 12 years old when he came to the throne, which probably indicates his father was no longer alive, or at least not an influence in his life and capable of much. Right. Right. Chronicles doesn't mention for us the name of his mother, but you'd find that in the book of Kings. It will mention who his mother was. And I can't remember if his mother had any particular background or connection that would indicate anything. We saw that before, right? That the godless mothers would sometimes lead, lead the children astray too, because they had a big influence on them, or they'd make them godly. Okay. Sure. Yeah. He's nearing high school age here. Yep. Just about a teenager. Yep. And if that person is in charge, their sinful nature gets arraigned when they still need discipline and they still need learning. I'm sure that that could cause some harm as well. Sometimes the listening doesn't even happen when you have more than 12 years, yeah. But still, God gives parents that time and even even in the very young ages, we see men like Moses are influenced by their parents for the rest of their life because of those early years. So that can make a big impact. <clears throat> yeah, that's what we're going to see here. God's great patience. Uh, even though the first I want to set that scene that we realize how evil he is, despite all the opportunities, but doesn't that all the more emphasize the patience of the Lord? Uh, that this is allowed to go on. So the next paragraph there, God kept sending prophets to Manasseh and the people, but they kept not paying attention. God is patient. He also wants us to be careful not to let those who despise him despise, despise his gifts. Um, Matthew 7, he says, Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. 
if you do, they will trample them under feet, under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So I wanted to discuss this. How do you determine if it's worthwhile or wise to try to reach someone who's persistent in evil? When are you throwing pearls to swine and when are you being patient and trying to reach someone with God's word? Okay, so the discussion starts off with maybe a wise comment. We Maybe we don't know, right? On the one hand, we do want to listen to Jesus' warning. There's a point where you want to be careful that you don't keep allowing someone to despise God's word. Eventually you have to say, um, fine, if, if you're not going to honor it, I need to give this word to someone else, right? So th there is a point where that comes. Or, as Jesus warns, they'll trample on you. If you give them what's holy uh, and you know they're going to despise it and disgrace it, uh, maybe it's not wise to do so, as Jesus warns. But at the same time, God himself kept giving someone like Manasseh his prophets and his word and allowed them to trample over them for so long. So maybe maybe that's a good place to start with such a discussion is don't be quick to decide whether you're able to withdraw God's word or should continue to give God's word. Just err on the side of mercy, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, if it, if it becomes quarrelsome and you can tell it's not going to produce any fruit, yeah, it's, it's okay to halt the, the conversation, hang up the phone call and say, well, we'll talk when you've cooled down, right? Um, maybe you have to listen to what Scripture says. There's a time for everything, right? And when it comes to outreach, look for every opportunity, but don't think you have to do it today. Maybe maybe got to open the door tomorrow. If today you feel it's not going to be fruitful, look for an opportunity, right? I think that's what God was doing with Manasseh too, is continuing to give him opportunities, uh, even though at times he would trample the word. We're going to see that the opportunity would present itself in Manasseh's life. Okay, here's a thought for us now. Consider how much of God's working in your life is a result of his wonderful patience and grace for sinners. You might say to yourself, I'm not Manasseh, but don't we too need ongoing patience from our God? In unbelief, we cannot respond, but in faith, we respond to his grace. That is, once he's called us to faith now, we're, we're not like Manasseh, where we can keep on saying, nope, 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 I'm going to trample over that, I'm going to despise that. He's given us his spirit. He's called us to see the wonderful treasures and to taste and see that the Lord is good. Can you identify two or more appropriate responses to God's rich patience and grace in your life? What's that? Sure. Live a life of thanksgiving. Starting with thanksgiving for his great patience. Oh, Lord, thank you for, you could say, even putting up with me, right? Yeah. Uh, a response to that is to say, God has been so gracious to me, and share that as part of your witness to others. You know, don't let your witness be, God's made me a better person. Let your witness be, God has dealt with me despite the fact that I haven't lived up worthy of the calling all the time as I ought. Yeah. So, yeah, good responses. Thanksgiving, sharing and witnessing to what he's done for you. Yeah, remaining in that word. If he, if he gives you his word patiently, and there's times that we haven't honored it as we should, take every opportunity now to honor it. Turn from that, that mindset that would once no longer treasure his word to one that does treasure his word. Yeah. So continue to, as Paul says, work out your salvation. In other words, hold on to what you have, grow in what you have, set roots. You know, if, you're, if your seed of faith has been planted, set roots for when the day of trial comes. Continue to build up others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But then it comes back to God's mercy and patience in the end. You can get frustrated because, oh, I'm I'm growing in faith. I've I've studied the word. But to realize God's great patience that led you to that point and offer that to the person that's not yet growing. All, all comes back to reflecting on God's mercy. Okay, so we looked at how great is God's mercy. I think we have enough time now to reflect on how great is God's patience. So, I mean, yeah, we looked at how great God's patience. Now let's reflect on how great God's mercy. So that's page 19. So the lifetime of Manasseh displays God's patience. The end, or I guess it must be near the end of Manasseh's life, displays God's mercy. Can you name some people from scripture that come to mind when you think of a grand display of a conversion or of repentance? Okay, so she discovered uh, Jesus, you know, is not just the prophet, but the, the Messiah who was foretold to come. And suddenly this woman who is living a sinful lifestyle is a witness. Yeah. Paul, someone who was an enemy of the church, now a, an apostle. Definitely a grand display of conversion. One that came to my mind was the people of Nineveh, the idea that they were their great wickedness and suddenly they're receiving the mercy of God and he's not destroying them. You could probably list a lot more. Um, probably you noticed um, it's not that common. More common is someone who's given the gift and they despise the gift. Because if you look at the line of the kings, yes, Manasseh could have a little sliver of light color at the end, but he's evaluated as doing evil. So I, I left him colored with a black crown and a black robe, indicating he's the one that did wickedness during his reign. And that's what he's generally credited as, even though he converted at the end. But none of the other kings repented and converted. They all went the other direction. They all drifted away, or they made a 180, or they fell into some grievous sin and didn't repent. Uh, you, you see so much the other direction, which is sad when you think about it. Uh, God's grace is there. His mercy is there. His word is powerful to create, to convert. Uh, but so often it's rejected, despised, and lost. Yeah. Maybe I could give like a little tiny stripe of white at the end. That would ruin the surprise when we read about him, right? And as I mentioned before, that, that chart, if you're looking at the Nat chart of the kings, it's not based off of, because we don't know whether they lived or died in faith. It's based off of the, the fruit of faith in their life, their works. And that's actually the evaluation that the scripture gives. Scripture doesn't say, and he went to heaven and was with the Lord in paradise. It just says what they did during their lifetime. So on the basis of the evaluation of what he did in his life, the reforms at the very end weren't quite enough to undo the fact that he was evil during his reign. Yeah. Sure. Well, by the by, God's mercy and grace, you can say, as a person grows in faith, uh, the more they deserve to be to God's glory, accredited as the salt and light of the world, and that that's God's working. It's He who works in us to do those things. But Manasseh didn't have much time for that. Okay. So now we're going to read about you know. Consider what's more amazing, you know, God's mercy and patience or their blindness up until they repented. Uh, both are striking. We're going to read about one of the greatest conversion stories. And it's found in only a few verses. Second Chronicles 33, verse 10 and following. So his conversion is only mentioned in like two or three verses. And then just a couple describing afterwards. But it's one of the greatest in the sense of most miraculous turnarounds in Scripture and sudden turnarounds. So I'm going to read that starting at verse 10. We'll pick up where we left off there in 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and the people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought the officials of the army of the king of Assyria against them. They led Manasseh captive with hooks. They bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. Um, now you've got Assyria and um, Babylon. The, the Chaldeans would have been involved at this point. When he was in dis distress, he sought the favor of the Lord and humbled himself deeply before the God of his fathers. He prayed to the Lord, and the Lord responded to his prayer and heard his plea for mercy. He brought him back to Jerusalem 
into his own kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is the true God. Afterward, he built an outer wall for the city of David in the valley from the west of Gihon Spring to the entrance of the fish gate. He encircled Ophiel and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders in the army in the fortified cities of Judah. He removed the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord. He removed all the altars he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and threw them outside the city. He restored the altar of the Lord and offered sacrifices of fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it. He commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Uh, after the temple was established as the center of worship, the high places were really illegitimate. But at least now they were being used for a godly purpose after his reforms. So, yeah, that was part of it. You know, remember when the the center of worship was built in Bethel. You know, you won't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. So a little bit more locality. Uh, but also it was part of the common practice of the, the Canaanite worshipers. It was a, a nearby hill near the city gate, perhaps sometimes too, uh, that they would have these centers of worship. Originally, they were actually often used for worship of the Lord, uh, but they became quickly became illegitimate centers of worship that involved false worship. Uh, picture, it's like a, a church that doesn't practice church fellowship anymore, and every church congregation does its own thing. How long would it take if they're not holding each other accountable to God's word for some of them to start drifting away? Okay, so let's discuss. Um, the details surrounding Manasseh's conversion are not shared. Can you list at least three important aspects of his conversion that help us see God's mercy? Yeah. yeah. Right. So that that's why I call this conversion. This is this is not a revival that somehow Manasseh he kind of loved the Lord and also worshipped these idols and then fixed his life. No, this is a conversion because yeah. he's not a smoldering wick. He's a he's just a dead branch ready for the fire. Yeah. All's a different example, yeah. Yeah, so Paul knew, you could say, knew the Lord, but denied his son, Christ. Yeah. And so persecuted the Savior, the Messiah. Whereas Manasseh, he just outright rejected the Lord. And this is a, a true 100% turnaround. Paul is uh, almost uh, changing tracks. Paul's headed in the wrong direction on, the, on a, a parallel track. And he's headed to hell as he's rejecting the Messiah. His bridge is going to burn, but he jumps tracks as he, co he converts. As Manasseh converts... He actually goes from idol worship to the true God. Yeah. And don't misunderstand, Paul was, he was lost, right, without mm -hmm. Christ. Yeah. And that was a conversion. But Manasseh's from idol worship to the living God here. Uh, one of the greatest conversion stories shows a complete turnaround. Yeah. I think that that's very clear. Not just uh, idol worship, but he's head first all in on that idol worship. Yeah, this is, this is, in a sense, like Paul's in that it's all God's working. He never would have turned on his own. God turned him by creating circumstances and giving him his message. Think of all the times that God sent those prophets. He heard them. He had to, at least the moments before he said, execute him or whatever. The messages were still being shared. So despite all his attempts to shut out the Lord, when he's finally locked up in prison, what comes to his mind? Oh, the God who preached repentance and mercy. Maybe he'll hear me. He, he has an understanding of the Lord, just enough uh, that in prison he can call out to the true God in his desperation for mercy. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, this is a, definitely an aspect of God's mercy that I'm going to give you what you need, not what you want. And what Manasseh needed was be humbled, brought down to his knees, and to suffer imprisonment and to lose everything. And that can be a good thing. And that's the mercy of God. If, if you're on the wrong course and you're an enemy of God, to have him, have you face a, a bad circumstance in your life. Many believers that have converted after such experience have expressed how grateful they were that God, in a sense, woke them up through those circumstances, caused them to reflect on their life and turn to the Lord. Any other aspects of God's great mercy that stand out? So it's a, such a great turnaround. God uses circumstances to bring this about. And that's the only way it could happen. Manasseh wasn't going to create a circumstance. Yeah, that's a, a big part of repentance and conversion is recognizing who God is involves humbling yourself. Uh, and that's only, that too is the work of God, that we recognize we're but dust. We deserve nothing from our God. In what ways do we also need the same type of mercy? So we talk about we need the same patience that Manasseh needed. In what ways do we need the same type of mercy which God displayed for Manasseh? And we're all sinful. We, we can't say, well, I've never done the horrible things Manasseh has done, so I don't need mercy. Our sins are different, but we still need mercy. Yeah, the one makes you guilty. You still need, even just for the stumbling once, you're guilty of breaking all of God's law. And we should recognize, just like Manasseh, we needed God to sometimes intervene to wake us up from our spiritual slumber. For him, it wasn't slumber, it was death, but maybe for us, we're slumbering and we're in danger. Wandering from the faith. Um, how does the mercy of God and the accounts of conversions like Manasseh's influence the way we carry out God's call to make disciples of all nations? Yeah. So when it comes to, let's go to this mission field or that mission field, or this person is worth getting the word, this one's not, God can change the heart of anyone. And if, you know, Paul and Manasseh don't make that clear, or the people in Nineveh, the, the working of God to change hearts is powerful. We should never write off someone as forever lost until God has decided that uh, his patience leads to his mercy for anyone. Changes our mission work, doesn't it? Imagine all those prophets, 55 years. We don't know how old he was when he was thrown in prison, but decades of trying to reach somebody and having decades of rejection, at what point you say, well, uh, give up, but God's mercy is still there. So if you know someone who is struggling and either needs to be strengthened or someone who's weak in danger of falling away, or just someone who's, a, as the scripture describe, a dead branch ready for the fire and that judgment day is coming, remember the great mercy that God has and that it's still available to them. And now is the day of salvation. And now is our time as the body of believers to make every opportunity to reach those who are lost. And we shouldn't be too surprised when we got places like our, our seminary being built in Vietnam, which is full of Buddhism. And people are, you know, rejected for turning to the Christian faith that we're getting a, a foothold with the gospel in such a land right now through our church body. And, and, and. an open door to such a place. Yeah. Right, the salt and light is desired and then they realize it's more powerful than they thought and it offers more than they could have imagined I mean, yeah yeah that, that was part of their 
their draw and their witness says, as they faced their hardships and their persecutions, that people saw what they had. And filled with the Spirit, they were able to witness that way. And the, it kind of reminds me, too, of the gospel showers. How long will it shower on our land right now? God continue to give us mercy, but he can just as well decide he's going to send that to another land. It will be lost. Any other thoughts on Manasseh? Obviously, we could spend a lot looking at such a heavy and weighty account and a miraculous conversion. we got a few more kings to go before we close our study. So you can go ahead and keep that handout, that booklet. If you're joining us through the website, I encourage you to check out the, the webpage. You'll see the view handouts, and you can download the handout for yourself. Thanks for joining us. Um, why don't we close with a prayer about what we studied. Especially King Manasseh. Help us to recognize this mercy and this patience in our own lives and to share it with the world around us. Encourage us through what you have done through his life and build us up uh, through living according to the warnings that were given also in his life. We pray this be done for us and for all of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining. So it's the first time I've done this. I think I click right here.